Okay, good morning. So nice to see all of you. Uh, I've been asked to announce that this morning's shear is sponsored in loving memory of Galia Bat Menachem HaKohen, Alea Shalom, whose yard site was on the 14th of Cheshvan. The uh, announcement, I think, was supposed to have been made last week, but uh, there was some miscommunication. We didn't get the message in time. So uh, apologies, so please forgive us. Apologies to the family. Uh, we're dedicating this morning's shir in loving memory of Galia Bat Anachem, HaKohen, Aleh Shalom, Shetahei Nishmata, Sura, Tzor HaChayim. Okay. You know, every few years, it seems almost with every Knesset, there's a debate, a discussion, a public conversation, a national conversation as to how to properly implement the Tochnit Haliba, a core curriculum, reading, writing, arithmetic in schools across the state of Israel and particularly in religious schools, Haredi schools, ultra Orthodox schools, where sometimes in those communities there is resistance to even a core curriculum, even learning the basics, reading, writing, arithmetic. And what I'd like to explore together with you this morning is what is the attitude towards secular studies? How, how did Chazal and Argeonim and Rishonim relate to the study of reading, writing, arithmetic, to uh, these basic things? On the one end, we have a mitzvah, to study Torah, and that mitzvah of Torah study applies every moment, every waking moment. At night, during the day, we'll see. Uh, and, and so the question, of course, becomes is, if you do engage in secular studies, does that come at the expense of Torah study? Are they in conflict? This morning's shir is titled, is, Torah and Mada, knowledge, the pursuit of knowledge, secular knowledge, secular studies, are they in conflict or can we reach some sort of harmony? Conflict or harmonia, two great Hebrew words this morning. Uh, are they in conflict or do they complement one another? Okay, that's our question this morning. So uh, if you take a look here at source number one, and I'll, I'll put the materials, the sources up here on the screen for those of you joining us on Zoom. Okay, so source number one is a famous passage from Eicha Raba, the Medjish Raba, from Megillat Eicha. And there, our sages teach, Im yomar adam yesh chokhmah bagoyim tami. If an individual tells you there is wisdom to be found among the Gentiles, believe him. Now, what wisdom are we talking about? Well, we'll see. We'll see uh, later on this morning that Chochmah refers to different types of wisdoms, different types of knowledge, different disciplines. It can refer to mathematics, astronomy, the sciences, medicine. So if someone tells you there's wisdom to be found among the Gentiles, believe him. Hadahu dichtiv, and the Medrash brings the Pasuk from Sefer Ovadia. Hadahu dichtiv, ve'avadati chachami me'edom utvuna me'har esav. Pasuk actually begins on that day, Hashem announces, I will make the wise vanquish, ve'avadati, like, uh, to make, make it disappear. I will vanquish the wise from Edom, and understanding from the mountain of Esau. So that would imply what? If, if in the future, when there's this day of reckoning, Hashem is saying through his prophet Ovadia, that when there'll be this day of reckoning, he's going to vanquish and make vanish wisdom and understanding from Edom and Esau, that implies that there is wisdom and there is knowledge in Esav, in Edom, okay? That these things do exist. 
So, you know, don't think we have the monopoly on wisdom. However, the Medrash continues, yesh Torah bogoyim al tamim. But if someone tells you that there is Torah, there is a divine ethic, there are divine morals and values to be found among the Gentiles, don't believe them. In other words, we do have the monopoly on Torah, okay? We do have the monopoly on divine wisdom. We may not have the monopoly on wisdom and knowledge, bichlal, but we do have the monopoly on divine wisdom, and that is our Torah dichtiv. And here, the Medrash brings a pasuk from Eicha Perek Bet, the second chapter of, of Lamentations, it's, uh, Perek Bet, Pasuk Tet, there it says, Malka goim in Torah. Okay. The kings and, and officers among the Gentiles, but there is, there is no Torah. The Pasuk continues that there are also, there also no, no prophets. In other words, we have the monopoly on Torah. So if someone tells you there's Torah to be found among the Gentiles, don't believe me. Wisdom, knowledge, believe me. There's no, there's no conflict here. And we'll see there's a principle to accept wisdom. And this is something that you, you certainly find among the great Go'onim and the Rishonim in our classical literature, if you will. There is this idea to accept wisdom wherever it comes from, to recognize that we don't have the monopoly on truth. Okay. So it would seem that there is wisdom to be found, and maybe we can even learn from that wisdom. Yet, we have a passage here in source number two, Agmara from Masechet Menachot, Daf Tzaditet, Shal Ben Dama, Ben Achoto Shal Rabbi Shmuel Rabbi Shmuel. So Ben Dama, he asks his uncle, the great Rabbi Shmuel, what about learning Chochma Yivanit? Greek wisdom. He says, Kigon Ani, what about me? Shlamati Kola Torah Kula. Ben Dama says, I've studied the entire Torah. I've mastered the entire Torah. Mahul Ilmot, Chochmat Yivanit. Can I learn now Greek wisdom now that I've studied and mastered the entire Torah? Kara Allah Hamikra Hazeh. Oh. Rabbi Yishmael, he brought this verse. The, uh, a pasuk from Sefer Yehoshua from the book of Joshua. Lo yabush Sefer Torah azani picha vekitabo yomam valayla. The this book of Torah, it shall not leave your mouth. You shall meditate upon it day and night. And this pasuk is the source for the fact that there's a mitzvah to study Torah day and night. There's no specific shiur. There's no finite time that one dispenses of his obligation of studying Torah. It's not like you study Torah for five minutes a day and you're done. There's a mitzvah to study Torah the entire day, day and night, whenever you have time. So Rabbi Yishmael is telling him, wait a minute, you wanna study Greek wisdom? Well, here there's a mitzvah to study Torah day and night, cites the pasuk from Yehoshua, and tells him, he instructs him, say uvedok sha'ina lo min hayom, velo min halayla, velimod ba, Find a time that is neither day nor night, and then you can study Greek wisdom. So what is Rabbi Shmuel telling his nephew, his impressionable nephew? That you can. That you can, right, obviously, because there is no time that is neither day nor night. <laughs> it's either day or it's night. There is no time that's neither day nor night. So in essence, he's telling his nephew that you cannot study Greek wisdom. Now we have to make an important distinction between wisdom and Greek wisdom. Okay, now that's crucial. What's the difference? So uh, there's a lot written on this. But wisdom again, we'll see more examples in a few moments. Wisdom refers to different types of secular knowledge, what we might call Mubechol or Mada, Torah, Mada, Mada being uh, mathematics, sciences, astronomy. Uh, we'll see if literature and philosophy are included in that as well. So 
that is found among the Gentiles, science, medicine, these things. That is wisdom that one may engage with. But it would seem from this passage that there's a type of wisdom that the sages did not view well, and that would be Greek wisdom. In fact, there's a Gemara Masechet Sota, where uh, the Talmud there says that one who teaches his son Greek wisdom is cursed. Cursed be one who teaches his son Greek wisdom. Now, the context there, and, and this may shed light on what Greek wisdom is, as opposed to just chokhmah, just wisdom. Uh, Greek wisdom, and, and the, the Gemara that Sota is discussing the Chashmonaim and discussing Hellenism. So it would seem that, that Greek wisdom is, uh, is a key word for Hellenism, for heresy, apostasy, paganism. Um, some want to suggest that it means Greek philosophy. And there actually is a, a big discussion among the Rishonim as to whether one can engage in the study of philosophy or not. Right? Whether philosophy in general is forbidden, can't learn the classics, or maybe, no, it's only forbidden to engage with the original you know, classics, the Greek philosophers, but you can study Greek philosophy as distilled through the Rambam and you, the Halevi, and others, other great sages that quote these sources. Or maybe even that is, is verboten. Very, very controversial. And as you know, the Rambam in his lifetime was very controversial because he, uh, he, he taught and wrote about philosophy. So there's a major discussion about philosophy in general. Some want to suggest that maybe uh, this is a reference to philosophy, that while we can engage with different types of, of knowledge, different uh, sciences, different disciplines, but maybe philosophy is, uh, is off limits. Others say, no, that this is, Chachma uh, Yivani refers to, we're talking about Hellenism, we're talking about uh, heresy, we're talking about um, you know, apostasy, paganism, these types of things, okay? So it's important to make a distinction. And you see that in Chazal, there, there is a, a clear line between Chochma and Chochma Yivani. And so I put here a number of examples, in the next few sources from passages in the Gemara, where you see that, Chazal engaged in the sciences and mathematics. And here's a Gemara in Masechet Shabbat and Daf Ayin Hay in source number three. It talks about the fact, it's this, discussing Tukufot and Mazalot, calculating uh, the solstices, calculating the constellations, making astronomical calculations. And we'll, we'll come back to this because there is a reason why we may need to un understand how to make such calculations. Why? Why would you think we, you know, we, would, we would need to even you know, get an advanced degree in astronomy and make these astronomical calculations? Well, now we're, we have a Torah tidbits, right? We have a calendar, right? We know when everything is. But, uh, but before we had a fixed calendar, okay, you needed to know when, when these kufot are, when these Mazalot uh, are in order to be able to establish a calendar. Okay. So we'll, we'll come back to that in terms of why, why, what use we have for these things. But, but just you know, uh, at a very surface level, the Gemara here criticizes one who does not know how to make such calculations. Someone who knows how to make such calculations and does not, meaning he studied these things, he has this skill, but yet he does not use this skill, so we criticize him, or brings a pasuk, criticizes him. I'm just going to go quickly for the sake of time. And then Rabbi Yochanan says, or Rabbi, Rabbi Shmuel, Bar Nachmedi, in the name of Rabbi Yochanan, uh, he says that it's actually a mitzvah to make such calculations, and brings a pasuk as well, brings a verse to support the fact that there's a mitzvah to make such calculations. You know, we'll come back, why? But you see that our sages viewed an understanding of, of astronomy and making these calculations in a very positive light. And, and not just astronomy, uh, and not just these calculations, but other things as well. Here's a, a Gemara here in source number four from Masechet Sukkah, and Dav Chofchet. It begins with a, a, a Bryce, actually, right? Tanu Rabbanan, Shmonim Tamidim Hayulo Lehillel HaZakein. Hillel HaZakein had 80 students, okay? And then he goes on to describe them, the best of them, the greatest of them, the Ariyei Shebechabura, if you will, the Gadol Shebekulan, 
right, was Yonatan ben Uziel. The Katan Shebekulan was Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai. Um, the, the smallest of which was Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai. He was no slouch either, by the way. And then he goes on to describe Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai's virtues, okay, and, and uh, how great he was. He doesn't need my endorsement, of course. Um, but uh, it says you know, Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai was so great, he, he knew all of Mikra, Mishnah, Gemara, Halachot, Agadot, right? He didn't, he didn't neglect, Shlo Yiniach, Mikra, Mishnah, Gemara, Halachot, Agadot. He didn't neglect any area of Torah, whether it was Tanakh, whether it was Mishnah, Gemara, the halachic portions of the Gemara, the agadic portions of the Gemara, right? Whether it's a, a legal statement or just some sort of homily, some sort of lesson, some sort of drasha, he knew it all. Diktuke Torah, Diktuke Sofrim, right? He knew all sorts of things related to um, uh, minutia and, and uh, of, of, of Torah and related to uh, Diktuke Torah, Diktuke Sofrim, different languages and how to make different inferences. Kalim v'chamurim v'zerot shavot. He knew all the different halachic principles. And then, and this is important for our discussion this morning, Tkufot, the gematriot. He also knew how to make these mathematical calculations, these astronomical calculations, the Tkufot, which we said are the, the, the seasons, the solstices. Okay, he knew how to calculate the solstices, the seasons, the different positions of the, of the, the sun and the earth. Okay, and he knew gematria, which could mean, could mean numerology, right? Like we say gematria, you know, people have a, a Dvar Torah, it's like a, maybe an engagement party or something, and someone gets up there, he doesn't really have what to say, so he like takes the name of the chassan, the name of the kal, and he makes a cute little, cute little vort with the, uh, a numerical value. It, it could just mean geometry or some, some type of uh, mathematics here. It doesn't have to be understood to mean uh, gematria per se. Um, it, it most likely, because it's a little, you know, there together with Tkufot, most likely he's referring to, to mathematics. He understood geometry or some form of mathematics. Okay? He, Sichot Malachei Hasharet, Sichot Shedim, Sichot Kalim. He, um, he understood the language of angels and demons and trees, whatever that means, okay? I, I don't, I'm not going to pretend to understand what that means. Uh, but then, Mishlot Kovsin, Mishlot Shualim. Interesting. He also knew the parables, the Mishalot. He, he, he knew the stories of Kovsin, people that, you know, uh, launder clothes, <laughs> okay? And the stories of Shualim, of foxes, fox tales? I don't know how to just, uh, describe that, but he, he knew folk tales. He was fluent in literature, in the literature of his time. Now, why do you think he'd be interested in, in literature? Right? How would that serve him? Any suggestions? Includes the passage of Argadol, the Davar Katani, new big things, small things. You know, why the interest? It, it, it says he could make these calculations. And then the Gemara is describing his greatness and says that he knew these folk tales. I don't know if it was Aesop's fables, you know, he, he knew the, the folk tales of his time. Well, it's interesting. The Gemara in many places quotes folk sayings. It says, oh, the Gemara teaches a principle and says, oh, this is what, this is what they say, this is what people say. This is a popular folk expression. And, and the Gemara also quotes different Mishalim, different parables, different folk tales, allegories. Yes, I'm sorry? His mother, His mother must have taught him. Well, I think, I think that, you know, if a person is, is fluent in, in literature, is worldly and broad, and we'll come back to this idea a little later on this morning, but a person who's, who's worldly and broad and fluent even in, in folk tales, you know? So that can aid him in teaching Torah. He can give you an analogy. He can communicate effectively, right? He can communicate something, this lofty Torah idea. Lofty Torah ideas and ideals. He can communicate them effectively based on his knowledge of folk sayings and folk tales and stories. It's like a rabbi who's a good storyteller and knows a lot of jokes, okay? I'm really bad at jokes. I'll, I'll spare you. 
all spirit. Okay, but so interesting, here you have an example of, of one of the greatest chachamim, right? And uh, okay, you know, he's the, the smallest of the, uh, of the group for Hillel Azakim, but again, he was certainly no slouch. And it describes how he was fluent in different sciences and mathematics and even, even the literature of his time, even the folk tales. Here's a passage in source number five. This is the Gemara from the first parak of Sanhedrin, which describes how uh, they were going to give Rav smicha before he left Eretz Yisrael for Bavel. You can only give real smicha in Eretz Yisrael. Ish mi ish, the real smicha, the, uh, the chain of transmission from Moshe Rabbeinu. And they were deciding, you know, what level, so to speak, of, of uh, smicha they could give him. And could they allow him to be matir bechorot, to, to allow animals to be offered in the holy temple, on the Mizbeach? Uh, did he have that level of, of knowledge? That, uh, were they going to give him that authority? There are different levels. There's, there's yore yore, yadin yadin. Right nowadays, you know, that, that rabbis, although our smicha is different, it's just really heter hora, it's permission to answer questions. Yore, yore, they say, you know, can he teach? Yes, he could teach. He could rule on matters of iser veheter. Yadin, yadin, he can be a dayan, he can adjudicate uh, civil matters, money matters, dine mamanot, okay? And then there's yatir, yatir, can we give him uh, permission to be matir b'choro? That's the question here. And Rav says about himself, look where I've underlined, in that context, He says, yeah, I'm an expert in the anatomy of sheep. I spent 18 months studying by the shepherds in the fields in order to understand which blemishes are permanent and which blemishes heal, and then the animal could be offered as a korban. So he had the requisite knowledge, he's saying. Right? He had the requisite knowledge. In fact, they ended up not giving him this authority to be Mati Bacharot because he knew too much. He was too much of an expert and they were afraid that other people might rule based on his lenient rulings. They might take certain leniencies and latitudes based on what they perceive him to do and they don't have the same level of knowledge as he. And so ultimately it was dangerous. It was dangerous to give him that authority because other people might say, wait a minute, he permitted this and it will come, they'll come to error. They'll come to, to make a mistake. They'll come to bring an animal that, uh, that does have a permanent blemish, that does have a real womb. Um, they'll, they'll take certain leniencies and latitudes based on him, but the difference is that he was an expert. So here, here, you, see, here you see an example of, uh, again, uh, one of our sages where it's not enough just to, just to study Torah in the base medrash, just to, you know, open up the Gemara and, and stay within the, you know, the Dalit Amos of the base medrash and your ivory tower cloistered off. Here, he felt it necessary to, to go out into the field, to roll up his sleeves and to, to study the biology, the physiology, the anatomy of these animals. And otherwise, how do you pass it? Again, we'll, we'll come back to that idea very shortly. Yes, I'm sorry, you had a question. Oh, no, it was just, these are Amorayans. How would they be interested in Karbanot? Historically, Karbanot were earlier than the Amorayans. Okay, the Seder. It's a, it's, it's a good question, but nevertheless, I, it's a good question. Nevertheless, this, this knowledge, uh, this knowledge is, is important. Uh, yeah, even if, yeah, even if, uh, correct, even if it's already after the Korban. A, the truth of the matter is, there's a whole, there's a whole discussion uh, as to when they, when they stopped offering korbanot. It's, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that even after korban by Shani, they continued to offer korbanot, specifically korban Pesach. I once wrote a whole article on that if you're interested, but, uh, but it's a good question. Okay. Uh, but here, source number six, certainly uh, very relevant even today. Rabbi Zeira, Rabbi Zeira, who went from Bavel, to Eretz Yisrael. Rabbi Zeri in source number six admits that he's not comfortable ruling on the laws of Nida 
without the proper understanding of the anat of a woman's body, of, of the anatomy, of the physiology, of the biology. Here. Okay, so you see that that knowledge is is indispensable. It's necessary. It's a sine qua non in order to pass. And we'll come back to that. We'll ask you know so. What are some different reasons to engage in the study of, of chokhmah, of, of wisdom, secular wisdom, secular knowledge? Limudei chol. Okay? Um, just for the sake of time, we're going to skip, but I put some interesting sources from Rav Sajagon here in source number seven. Um, but skip, to, skip here to, to source number eight. Certainly you find um, among the great Gaonim and... Uh, and Rishonim like the Rambam, but the great Gonim like Rav Sadja and Rav Haigon and others, how they uh, had a very positive view of, of secular wisdom, of secular knowledge, of, of getting a broad education. And here, it's a little hard to see, the text is a little hard to see, but the source number eight, this is a passage from Rav Yehuda Bar Barzilai of Barcelona, okay, who was Rav Yehuda Ben Barzilai of uh, Barcelona, um, well, like his name suggests, he, li he lived in, in Spain, in, in, Bar in Barcelona, uh, at the end of the 11th century into the early 20th century, and uh, was considered one of the Chachmei Svarad, one of the great scholars of Spain, and he wrote a book called Sefer Ha'itim, which is a halachic work that deals with time, interesting like the name suggests, Sefer Ha'itim, it deals with time. Um, we don't have the entirety of, of uh, the Sefer, we only have part of this, only the part of the, the Sefer is extant. But here in this passage, he um, describes, and this is really a fascinating passage, a little hard to read, but you'll bear with me. He describes Rav Haigon's, one of the great Gonim, the Gonic period, Ruda, Bar Bartzelai comes a little bit later after the Gonic period. He's a Rishon, but he describes what Rav Hai's curriculum was, what, what he instructed that they teach in, in the schools there. Okay? So he writes the following. Umishmei, this is um, the fourth line here. I can't really highlight the text, but if, you, uh, if you're look, viewing online on Zoom, you can see my cursor. He writes, Umishmei Rav Hai Itmar, it's been stated in the name of Rav Haigon, Mutar lilmod tinokot shel beta knesset, agav limutora, ktav aravi lecheshbonot. In addition to teaching them Torah, the children in the beta knesset, the school, the cheder, if you will, the children in the cheder, in addition to teaching them Torah, it's permitted to teach them ktav aravi, to teach them Arabic, lecheshbonot and to teach them mathematics, okay? Now, he doesn't mention science and other disciplines, but I'm sure that was part of the curriculum as well because the Gaonim looked very favorably on these things, on these disciplines. And then he continues that, of course, aval shelo ima Torah eno nachon. But if it's not, it doesn't, if it doesn't accompany Torah, so that's not proper. Obviously, they, they can't only learn limude chol, secular studies, but you have to have a balance of limude kodesh and limude chol, and that was not considered to be bitl Torah, right? Wait a minute. We we began, or we saw at the beginning of the shiur this pasuk that was quoted uh, here in source number two by Rabbi Shmuel, the pasuk from Sefer Yehoshua, that the Torah is never supposed to leave our mouths. We're supposed to engage with the Torah, meditate upon it day and night. So. If you're supposed to study Torah every moment, how, how do you instruct children limude chol? So the answer is that obviously, according to the Gonim, it was considered to be essential that these children have a basic understanding of language, language skills, ktav aravi, language skills, and mathematics. Yeah, you have a lot of fascinating sources here in source number nine. I put a passage from the commentary to Shir Hashirim of Rav Yosef Ibn Aknin. Yosef Ibn Aknin also, you know, uh, one of the Chachmei Svarad. He uh, lives around the same time as Yehuda uh, Habartzaloni. Uh, Yosef Ibn Aknin lives from 1150 to 1220. 
he was in contact with the Rambam, they had some correspondence. And here he describes how there were Ga'onim who, uh, on the board. Uh, there were Goonim who even engaged with <laughs> the Catholics, the Catholic priests, in order to make sense of certain passages in the Tanakh. Very strange, right? He, he relates a story about how there was this Rav Matzliach, Rav Matzliach ben Albert Sek, and, uh, and he had a question in terms of how to interpret a certain difficult verse. And he goes to Rav Haigon, again, the same Rav Haigon we just described, one of the great Goonim. And it says here, V'tsiva Rabbeinu Ha'izal, et Ramatzlech, she'elech el ha-katoli shel ha-notzri. V'yishalu ma'hu yodea, b'v'yur ha-pasuk ha-zeh. Right? And he asks him, or commands him, Siva actually, he commands him to go and ask the Catholic priests what they know about this verse, how they define this verse based on their interpretation, their knowledge. Now, um, you know, it could, could refer to what uh, ultimately becomes their, you know, their Bible, the uh, Targum Shivim, the uh, Septuagint translation of the, the, the 70 uh, Chachamim. We have uh, Gemara in, in Masechet Megillah and uh, in Masechet Sofrim and elsewhere describes how, uh, how, how uh, in, in Alexandria, the uh, Talmud forced, who was, was Talmud, right? Talmud, uh, was it Talmud? Forced the uh, 70 sages to translate the Torah into Greek, and a miracle took place. They all rendered the exact same translation, even when they had to make certain changes. The, uh, the king's name was uh, Arnevet, was uh, a rabbit, so they had to, to be careful how they, they translated it. They didn't want him to see that, uh, you know, my, what, my, my wife is, is, a, is behemoth mea? You're saying my wife is impure, unclean, as it says in your Torah, I can't eat her? So uh, there are all sorts of all sorts of uh, uh, changes they had to make. And the miracle was they all made the same changes. So it could be that, you know, that becomes, uh, whether it's the Vulgate or, or whatever early uh, translation of the, of the Bible that they had based on this Greek translation, it could be that that's why Rav Hai is telling Rav Matzliach to go and ask them because maybe they have some sort of version of what was an authentic source that had come from the... Chachamim, who were forced to translate the Torah into Greek, could be. Um, but uh, in any case, it continues, v'rabeinav, that was bad in his eyes. He didn't want to do that. Kishirazal shekashel av adavar al rab matzliach, hochiach oto, leimor, hein ha'avot v'akadmonim v'achsidim v'hein lanu l'mofet, hayu sholim al halishonot v'al abiurim etzel b'nei datot shonot. When Rav Hai saw that this was difficult for Rav Matzlich to go and ask the, the priests, the Catholic priests, for pshat in a posuk, to translate a posuk. So he said to him, he, he gave him musr, hochiachoto. He gave him some musr and he said, what about our, our forefathers? And, you know, the, the great, the great chachamim, the tanoim, the moraim, who were an example for us, what would they do? They would Go and ask now for, for translations, as I mentioned. They quote folk expressions all the time to prove a point. So they would ask people, people even of different religions, for their interpretation. Even shepherds, people tending to the sheep and the cattle, he says. Okay. So this, by the way, uh, is, is brought, this whole story is brought in order to prove, this is what he begins with, that, that there is chokhmah to be found among the Gentiles. And if someone quotes some chokhmah, some kernel of wisdom, 
even from members of the Umot Olam, the nations of the world, even from a non-Jew, right? That is still called Chochmah. This individual is called the Chacham. And, and you have to, you are obligated to pass it along, meaning find truth, seek truth from wherever it is to be found. Okay, there is truth and there is wisdom to be found even in this particular story. And it's a wild story, even among the, the Catholics, okay, even among non Jews, but even among the priests here. He went and, and asked him for a shot and a pasuk. Incredible story, which I bring to show you that our sages, and, and you know, it's, it's so interesting today, if you'd share this passage in many yeshivos, they'd throw you out, right? Wow, I don't, I don't believe, it. can't be, not possible, right? But you see how comfortable the great Gonim and Rishonim were with seeking truth and seeking wisdom wherever it is to be found. And they really believed that we don't have the monopoly on knowledge. We have the monopoly on Torah, fine, but not the monopoly on knowledge. And they were open and they were broad and they were worldly, okay? So now I'd like to ask the question, what purpose does it serve? Why study secular subjects? Why study math, reading, writing, arithmetic? Why insist on a core curriculum in yeshivos here in the state of Israel? So I think there are three different approaches, three different perspectives, okay? The first is, you gotta make a parnasa, you gotta make a living. Right? If you don't know read and write and arithmetic, how can you get a job? There's a value in studying secular knowledge, just a, a very utilitarian value, you'll be able to have a job, make a parnasa. There's a value in higher education, you know, in certain circles. Higher education, that's, that's asur, that's verboten, that's, uh, Shanda, right? Someone goes to get a higher education. Baruch Hashem, you know, in, in recent years, we've seen more and more technical colleges and programs open for the Haredi community where in their community, it might not yet be accepted to get, you know, a bachelor's degree or an advanced degree, master's, doctorate, you know, to get an advanced degree here in Israel. These things, of course, are different in the United States. Uh, the Haredi community in the United States is very different, but but we're, we're here in the state of Israel, so that's what we're speaking about this morning. But you've seen more and more, both for men and women, uh, technical colleges open to train young men and women in different fields, to educate them and give them the training in different fields and education in different fields, even if it's not a bachelor's program, but to train them to be able to go and make a parnasa, get a job. So the Mishnah here in source number 10, famous Mishnah from Masechet Avot, Perek Bet, Yafat Talmud Torah in Derech Eretz. Torah is beautiful when accompanied by Derech Eretz, worldly occupation. Different definitions of Derech Eretz, but the Rambam and many others understand it to mean a job. It's not enough just to study Torah, you gotta have a Parnassah. And so how are you gonna have a Parnassah if you don't have an education? Uh, my Rebbe, Zatzal or Tenler, who maybe uh, we'll mention a little bit more this morning, uh, just uh, passed away on Shmini Atzeret. Um, the Shloshim is actually uh, Friday. So he had a, a nice interpretation of this mission. He says, Yafa Talmud Torah in Derech Eretz. Torah study is beautiful when accompanied by a worldly occupation. It's one thing if the raw of the Posik, the Dayan, the Rosh Hashiva is a Talmud Chacham. Say it, okay, it's to be expected. Let's move on, may love. But when is it really yuffa? When is it beautiful? That's when the doctor, the lawyer, the accountant, the professional is a Talmud Chacham. The professional balances his profession with Torah study. That's a Kiddush Hashem. Okay. And the Rambam, both in his commentary on Masechet Avot and in his Hilchot Talmud Torah here in source number 11, the laws of Torah study is very critical of someone who engages solely in the pursuit of Torah study and 
divorces himself from all material concerns, doesn't make a parnasa, and is mefarnes himself. He provides for himself and his family based on handouts. Someone who has to go and collect and ask for handouts, he calls that a degradation of the Torah. He says, chilil, This individual has desecrated God's name. It's a chilil Hashem. Ubaza et Torah. And he has degraded the Torah. It's a bizayon. The kavam or hadat. And he has extinguished the light of religion, the flame of religion. The garam ra'alat smo. Vinatal chayav mina olam He brings evil, wickedness upon himself and removes himself from the world to come. And the Rambam writes that it's prohibited to just benefit from Torah study, study Torah and take handouts. Okay, but the Rambam believed a person has to balance Torah study together with a, an occupation. Yes? How did the Haredi world respond to a statement like this of the Rambam? They, they couldn't say, you know, the didn't hold the They don't. <laughs> they don't. And, <laughs> and those that do engage in apologetics and find other sources, which would seem to indicate that those who dedicate their lives to, to Torah study, solely to Torah study, Torah-tan, Omanitan, those who say that Torah is their profession, they're entitled to divorce themselves from all material concerns. And, and it's, it, the truth is, it's not so simple. I'm just giving you the Roshay Prakim, because even the Rambam at the end of Hilchot Shemitah Yovel makes such a statement. I think we once discussed that here in previous Shurim. The Rambam makes such a statement uh, that, you know, that we, we know that, for instance, that the tribe of Levi, the Kohanim and the Levim, they didn't go off to war, and they were the spiritual leaders of the Jewish people. And being the spiritual leaders and teachers of the Jewish people, they lived off the tithes off the Trumotu Masro, they didn't have to get a job. So the Raman continues and says, well, you know, so too, someone who sees himself, you know, as, as a spiritual descendant, even though he's not a card-carrying Levi or a Kohen, right? He sees himself as a spiritual descendant of, of Levi and uh, of, of the tribe of Levi. He too can, can, you know, divorce himself from the world and call himself Kodesh Kodeshi. But the question, of course, is, who can really say that about themselves? And, and, and are we talking about whole swaths of the population, whole sectors of the population? Are we obviously speaking of Yechide Zgula, very specific individuals there, right? Uh, you know, again, and, and, and I'll add to that, and people maybe who we can make an investment in, people that are going to be the future rabbis and leaders. Okay, so we can discuss that, but, but do we say that, you know, everyone, sits and learns in Kolo for their entire lives, or maybe just select individuals we as a community invest in because we're going to reap the benefits. We're gonna see the returns on our investment because they're going to be the leaders and teachers, spiritual leaders and the rabbis and the dianim and the post et cetera. But again, that, that's, that's a much larger discussion beyond the scope of uh, our conversation this morning. But you see from the Rambam, the Rambam is very harsh. It's very harif against those who, who don't balance Torah study with an occupation, okay? And I think they're just going to live off the Torah study alone. Again, I admit it's a much larger discussion, but that's for another time. But so, so just going back to our initial question, what's the value? If, if there is, if we do believe there is a value in studying secular knowledge, what is the value? The first, the first answer is very utilitarian, very practical. There's a practical value in getting an education, and that is that you'll be able to have a parnasa. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to go uh, to graduate school and get all sorts of advanced degrees, right? Uh, but it means that you have to study these things just basically to be able to, to make a parnasa. So that's, that's one approach, okay? Very, very utilitarian. A, there's a function to it, very practical. You need to study these basic things in order to have a parnasa. And to learn how to function in the world, right? You know, you, you, if you don't teach kids reading, writing, arithmetic, they're not going to be contributing members of society. They're not going to know how to, to you know, to, to engage with, with uh, society. So th that's, that's the most basic level, I think. The most basic level is you need to study secular education to know how to function in the world, to know how to navigate the world, and ultimately to make a parnas. Then there's a more loftier ideal, and that you find in the Rambam, Rambam, Rav Hirsch, a lot of nice sources here, but just for the sake of time, take a look here, source number 12. Um, the Rambam here in his Hilchot Yisodei HaTorah, in the second chapter, is discussing the mitzvah 
of loving Hashem. The mitzvah to love and to fear Hashem. Now, how do you come to love Hashem? How do you love someone you don't really know or understand? So the Ram continues and says, well, you know what? There's a mitzvah to understand Hashem in order to be able to love him. And how do you come to a knowledge of God? Any suggestions? Look where I've underlined. What is the path to love and fear God? Oh, you know how you come to love God ultimately? Through understanding him. Well, how do you understand God? It's by reflecting on his creations. What does that mean? Reflecting on his creations, his actions, his creation, his world, right? He's saying, then you're going to come to love God and you, you, you appreciate his creation. You, you experience his wonder and you see that there is no end to his wisdom. There's no end to, to all of this. And then immediately he'll come to love God and he'll praise God and he'll desire God with a great desire. Like David Amelech said, my soul thirsts for God, for the living God. My soul thirsts for Hashem. My soul thirsts for Hashem, for the living God. Okay? Now, what does the Rambam mean? What does it mean? You're going to like, like look at his handiwork, look at his creation. The Rambam and others explain that this means to understand Hashem's creation, to not just appreciate its beauty, but get into the kishkas. If you understand how things work, if you study astronomy and physics and mathematics and all of these disciplines and science and medicine, then you'll come to a great understanding. And you'll see, wow, Look at Hashem's creation. And you'll be awestruck and that will cause you to fall in love with Hashem and fulfill this mitzvah. Okay? I like you like that. Great. So that's a, a, a second level. And, and i just give you one example, but, but the Rishonim discussed this, um, you know, at, at, at length. Now, then there's a, a third level. And that also is somewhat practical. That's to be able to know how to apply Torah to this world. And like we saw at the beginning of the shir, how the Gemara in Masechet Shabbat instructs one to make these calculations of the solstices, these astronomical calculations and how it's a mitzvah to do so, right? ultimately to be able to create a calendar. This was before they had the Torah tidbits. You needed to know how to make such astronomical calculations to know when things would fall out. Rosh Chodesh, you know, uh, solstices, when, when should you start praying for rain, all these different things, right? Okay, so, you know, uh, there's different calculations. When, when, you know, when, when, the, when is the spring going to come? When is the, the things going to change? Uh, when, when should you make the Birkat HaChama, the blessing on the sun, right? You have to know that the position of the sun in relation with the earth, all these different things require these calculations. So a, a third approach is that you need to have a basic knowledge of these disciplines, of secular wisdom, of, of limudei chol, to be able to apply halacha. Halacha is not something that just exists, you know, in some cloister, in some ivory tower, right? In the, in the laboratory, in the Dalit Amos of the base medrash, in the four L's of the yeshiva. No, 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 it, you have to apply it. And, and as we saw, uh, Rav studied for 18 months among the shepherds, again, to be able to paskin whether this animal can be brought as a korban or not. Yes? Absolutely. Electricity. electricity. That's a great example. So Rosh Shlomo Zalman Arabach, when he wrote his Sefer on electricity, what is electricity? Is electricity, is it fire? When you turn a, a switch on, is it like lighting a fire? Are you in violation of the Isur of Havarat Esh, of kindling on Shabbat? Or no, maybe it's something else. How, how, how do you understand the physics of these things? Well, you know what? You have to ask the physicists. You have to study these things. So Rav Shlomo Zaman Auerbach, who did not have an advanced degree in electrical engineering, but he consulted with electrical engineers in order to be able to 
Paskin, in order to be able to write his Sefer, when he wrote his Sefer on electricity and halacha, he consulted with electrical engineers to understand the physics of electricity. IVF, so right, my, yeah, my, 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 my Rebbe, uh, Maureen Rebbe Ruf Tendler is at Sal, as mentioned Friday's his Shloshan. Uh, he was very much involved in all of these questions of science and halacha and uh, medical halacha, medicine, very sophisticated medical questions. He advised Rav Moshe Feinstein and all of Rav Moshe's chupos and Igros Moshe, all of the chuvot, all of the, uh, the uh, uh, response there on issues of medicine and science. Rav Moshe consulted with his faithful son in law, his beloved son in law, my Rav. Yeah. And, and uh, here in source number 16, I'm just skipping around. Um, unfortunately, we're almost out of time, but for homework, you'll take a look at the rest of these sources. Um, here in source number 16 is actually a source that my Rebbe Reb Tendler loved to quote. This is from the introduction of Sefer Euclides. What is Sefer Euclides? It's a translation into Hebrew of Euclid's The Elements. Okay. One of the, the classics of mathematics. Euclid, Euclid is like the father of uh, geometry. And this was published in The Hague in Tuf Kuf Mem. Okay, very difficult to read. I'm sorry, it's verse number 16. Hard to read, but um, it, it's not been digitized. It should be reprinted and digitized. But uh, this was a translation written by Rav Baruch of Shklov. Rav Baruch of Shklov was a close Talmud of the Vilna Gaon. And there he writes that he heard, Shamati mi pi kadosh. He, kefi, he heard from the Gon, the Vilna Gon's holy lips, holy mouth. To the extent one is lacking in their understanding of other types of wisdoms, wisdoms which we define as different disciplines, science, mathematics, medicine, astronomy, all these different disciplines, all these different wisdoms, secular wisdom, to the degree that one's knowledge is lacking, okay? His understanding of Torah will be lacking 100-fold. Because he says Torah and wisdom, Torah and Chochmah, or, you know, like the uh, slogan or the motto of Yeshiva University, Torah and Mada, right? They are Nitzmadim Yachad. They are, they are together. They're not in conflict with one another. Okay? And he says there in the introduction, that the Vilna Gon instructed him to translate these classics into Hebrew to make them accessible for the Jewish reader. Okay. And encouraged his other students to translate Greek classics and works of mathematics and astronomy and physics and all different sciences into Hebrew to make them accessible for the Jewish reader. This is incredible. Now there are those who raise eyebrows and scratch their head and ask questions, did the Vilna Gon really say this? Maybe, maybe Baruch of Shklov was, you know, some sort of uh, maskil. And there are those who make such accusations and question maybe whether Baruch of Shklov was a maskil. But I'll just mention that this Sefer Euclides, this translation of Euclid's The Elements into Hebrew, where he is quoting his Rebbe, the Vilna Gon, this was printed during the Vilna Gaon's own lifetime. So anyone who questions the veracity of this source, this source was printed during the Vilna Gaon's own lifetime. Okay, and here you have in source number 17, another source from another faithful student of the Vilna Gaon. Now the Vilna Gaon, of course, is often associated as the Torah-only approach, right? Uh, Vilna Gaon, full-time Torah. He knew Kola Torah Kula from the time he was a child, Torah, Kabbalah, all areas of Torah, but we know that the Vilna Gon also engaged in all sorts of disciplines. This is something that his children write about him. And here, his faithful Talmud, Rav Yisrael Mishklov, in his introduction to the Pata Shulchan, the Pata Shulchan is a very important work on the laws related to the land of Israel, the agricultural laws. Okay, very important this year. It's a Shemitah year. So people look at the Pata Shulchan a lot this year. And Rav Yisrael Mishklov, he says here that the Vilna Gon, it's known that he was involved in all different disciplines of different wisdom, right? Uh, algebra, he writes, Mishulashim. Mishulashim, I guess maybe geometry, right? 
triangles. Uh, the handasa, engineering, the chokhmat musika, even, even music. If you want to go and study music, as a musician myself, I, I, I like that. Uh, <laughs> but you see that, you know, in, in certain circles, the Vilna Gaon is associated with the Torah-only approach. Yet, if you take a look at what his children and his students write about him, he was involved in all different areas of Chochmah. Okay, and he saw no contradiction. There is no conflict. And this is the third approach, the third reason why you got to teach reading, writing, and arithmetic in schools, why you need a tochnit haliba, why having a secular education is so important, it's so essential, it's critical, because you need, according to the Vilna Gona and others, you need this knowledge to be able to pask in a shayla. And it's not just the Vilna Gona, it's your Shlomo Zaman Arabach, it's your Moshe Feinstein, and as I mentioned, and it's the Gemara, it's the Gemara in Shabbos. It says that you have to know how to make these calculations, the astronomical calculations, the Kufot, the solstices. It's Rab in the first parak of Sanhedrin who spent 18 months in the fields with the shepherds to study the anatomy of sheep, okay? This knowledge is essential, it's critical. Just end with a Mishnah from a Sechet Avot, third parak. Another passage that Mori the Rebbe was fond of quoting. It's a very strange Mishnah at face value. The Mishnah teaches Rabbi Shimon Omer, someone who's walking along the way. And he's learning. You know, you see people sometimes, they got a safer open, right? They're learning as they're walking. Or maybe he's reviewing a Mishnah in his head. So he's walking along the way and he's learning. But he stops learning in order to say what? To Omer, and he says, Mana ilan ze. Wow. Umana nir ze. He stops his learning in order to appreciate a beautiful tree or a beautiful field. He says, wow, what a nice tree that is. What a, what a beautiful field that is. Malel avakatuv, the pasuk, relates to him, ki ilu mitchayev ben asho. It's as if he's responsible for his own death. As if he's liable with the death penalty. Now, obviously, that's not meant literally, Okay. Dibru Chachamim B'Lashon Guzma, our sages often speak in exaggerations and hyperbole. We're not supposed to understand this Mishnah literally. He's not obligated to the death penalty. This is not an offense where you're Chayav Mitah, God forbid. But the Mishnah is condemning him for stopping his learning in order to appreciate a beautiful tree or a beautiful field. Now, what does the Mishnah mean? What is it trying to teach us? We mentioned before, we saw the Rambam, that ultimately one can fulfill the mitzvah of Loving God, Avat Hashem, by appreciating the beauty of this world, appreciating God's handiwork, His creation, and through that and through the study of that, come to a knowledge of God and come to a love of God. Because how can you love someone you don't know? So you first got to get to know them. You got to get to know the Kala or the Chassan, right? So you got you to gotta understand Hashem through His handiwork, through the Bria, through the creation. So we said that that's a positive thing. There's a value in that. So what's wrong here? Why does Rabbi Shimon criticize someone who's studying, and he stops his studying in order to appreciate a beautiful tree or a beautiful field and say, wow, look, what a nice tree. Wow, look, look what a nice field. What's wrong here? Why does he condemn him? So my Rebbe, Rav Tenler Zatal explained, and it's such a profound explanation, that what's wrong here, you know, what's, you know what the problem is here? That he stops, he's mafsik, that's the key word that he's making some sort of a, a distinction between Torah and the natural world. That's why he's being condemned here, because he doesn't see how the two complement each other, how the two live in harmony, how the two are very much related. This is a criticism of one who says that there's Torah, and then there's the natural world and sciences and secular wisdom, but the two are in conflict. No, 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 there is no conflict. They complement one another. They exist together in a beautiful harmony. The problem is that he's mafsik. And the key is, we should be mafsik. We have to see how the two complement each other. They're not in conflict. How ultimately, by studying the Chol, secular knowledge, secular wisdom, studying these subjects, these different disciplines, ultimately, they shed great light on the Torah. Ultimately, they help us understand the Torah and apply the Torah to this real world. Okay, have a wonderful day, a great week.